ذكر الله جميعا أيها المؤمنون لعلكم تفلحون As much as you can, please move forward. We begin by praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by bearing witness that none has the right to be worshipped or unconditionally obeyed except for him. And we bear witness that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is his final messenger. We ask Allah to send his peace and blessings upon him. The messengers and prophets that came before him, the companions and his family that were with him and those that follow him in his noble path until the day of judgment. We ask Allah to make us amongst them. Allahumma ameen. Dear brothers and sisters, when we speak about forgiveness, it's usually a very sore topic. It's hard to forgive when you are the one who has been wronged. It is hard to forgive when someone has taken advantage of you. It's hard to forgive when the person that took advantage of you perhaps is someone that was very beloved to you or a family member or someone that you entrusted with something, even if that was just your, yourself it is very difficult to let things go. But I'm not going to give a khutbah about grudges. We have many khutbahs about grudges. I actually want to move to the next step, beyond the forgiveness piece. We often hear about how praiseworthy it is to forgive people and to let grudges go. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, let them forgive and overlook and pardon, because don't you want Allah to treat you the exact same way? So the, the principle that we live by is that you treat others as you want to be treated by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you want Allah to forgive you, then you forgive others. And that should be enough of a motivation even if the person that you're forgiving does not appear to be deserving of that forgiveness in any way whatsoever. You want that higher forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You want that mercy, so you show that mercy. But there is another element to it. What does forgiveness entail? And how do I deal with that person after I've forgiven them? You know, when we talk about a person's sins, and their sins that are between them and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the door is always open to Allah. Meaning if a person's offense only involves them harming themselves, then it's between them and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the opportunities for tawbah are limitless, literally limitless. A man comes to the Prophet and tells him, if I drink alcohol and, and then I seek forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, will I be forgiven? And the Prophet said if his, if his repentance was sincere, yes. He said, but what if I became weak again? I didn't intend to go back to it, but I went back to it. I fell into it again. The Prophet said, then a sin will be written for you. He said, but then I feel bad about it and I seek Allah's forgiveness again. And the Prophet said, if your forgiveness was sincere, and part of the sincerity of that repentance is that you will not return to it. You actually believe, you have that resolve that I will not go back to that sin. Allah will forgive you. But then if I go back to it again, and he did this with the Prophet up to eight times in one narration, and the Prophet told him, Allah will forgive you. And he said, Allah will not tire from forgiving you until you tire from seeking his forgiveness. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not become tired of, see, of, of granting you forgiveness until you get sick of seeking it. Meaning if it's between you and Allah and you keep falling into the same sin and you keep on asking forgiveness, Allah never says, well, it's been five times or six times. As long as each time your repentance, now you shouldn't fall back into it eight times or nine times if, you're, if you really have that resolve, but some people are really weak. But as long as every time you sought forgiveness from Allah, you really have that resolve that you won't return back to it. Okay? So if the sin is between you and Allah, it's one thing. But what happens when your sins involve other people? That's where it becomes tricky and more dangerous because Allah does not remove the rights of people because He chose to forgive someone. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not wrong the one who has been wronged again by not giving that person justice. So if that person chooses not to forgive when they are wronged, that's between you and that person. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not remove that person's right. Allah might forgive you but that person, you also have to seek their forgiveness and give them back their rights. What happens though 
beyond that. And I want to share with you all some interesting incidents from the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ. And the point of this is to actually develop a methodology from the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ because for many people, when they are wronged, they might forgive and they might truly forgive, but they don't know whether forgiveness means extending a second chance. And that's what I want to focus on today because I get asked this question every time. Anyone who's in any pastoral uh, capacity always gets asked, well, do I have to give them a second chance? If I've forgiven them, it's one thing. Do I have to forget? And there are some interesting incidents from the Prophet ﷺ that really give us a holistic picture of this and how we should develop a methodology. The first narration is a famous narration from Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu ta'ala anhu. He says that before the conquest of Mecca, before the Messenger ﷺ returned to Mecca, as, victor, as, as a victor, the Prophet ﷺ had that, that, that opportunity to be victorious now, to reclaim the land that he was run out of. He and the companions that were persecuted and run out of Mecca. And he's coming in Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam completely victorious with everyone at his mercy. The Prophet Sallallahu called Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu and he told Ali, go and call as Zubair ibn al-Awwam radiallahu ta'ala anhu. These were two of the strongest companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the most able companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he called them both to him and Ali says we were both on our horses. And the Prophet ﷺ said, make your way to Mecca. And when you get to such and such place, you're going to find a woman and she's going to have with her a camel that looks like this. So the Prophet ﷺ described the woman and he described the camel. He said, when you get to her, tell her to give you the letter that is with her because Hatib, Hatib ibn Abi uh, Balta'a, Hatib ibn Abi Balta'a sent a letter to the, to the mushrikeen in Mecca informing them of our plans. And he sent it with this woman. Meaning Hatib was putting the entire ummah at risk by sending a letter with this woman. So the Prophet ﷺ said, go to her and make sure that you get that letter. So Ali and Az-Zubair, they made their way to that place on their horses and they found that woman on her camel and Ali radiallahu anhu said her description was exactly as the Prophet ﷺ said. The camel was the same description. The place was exactly the same. So they asked her, they said, give us the letter. The woman said, I don't know what you're talking about. So Ali radiallahu anhu said, give us the letter or else we're going to have to search you for it. So she said, I don't have a letter. So Ali told her to get down from her camel. They searched everything on the camel first to see if the letter was hidden in one of the compartments or the pouches. And Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu said that we came up with nothing. So he said, I said to the woman again, give me the letter. And she said, I don't know what you're talking about. So he and Az-Zubair looked at each other. And Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu says that I said to Az-Zubair, we know that the Prophet ﷺ is not lying. We are 100% sure that the Prophet ﷺ is not lying. So Ali said to her, look, if you don't give me the letter, then I'm going to have to search you. And I don't want to have to do that. So finally, Ali says that she uh, reached into her aba and she, uh, into her garment, and she pulled out the letter, and she handed it back to Ali and, and, and Zubair radiallahu anhuma. So they made their way back to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and Ali says the Prophet sallallahu was sitting with his companions, and we handed the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam the letter, and Hatib was present. Hatib did not know that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam knew about the letter. So he was in this gathering with the companion. So you can imagine how you know, stressful this is going to be when he sees the letter being handed to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And, we, and, and when the letter was handed to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he read it, they said, Ya Rasulullah, qad khan Allah wa rasoolah wal mu'mineen. O Messenger of Allah, he betrayed Allah and his Messenger and the believers. So let us execute him. This is treason. The guy just put us all at risk. He sent this letter and he put us all at risk. If it would have reached them with the plans, then it would have gotten us all in trouble. So the Prophet ﷺ looked at Hatib. And you can imagine, Hatib, 
It would be justified to execute him. He knows he committed treason. He knows the letter is his. He has no way out of this. So the Prophet ﷺ said to Hatib, Ya Hatib, ma hamalaka ala ma sana'at. Oh Hatib, why did you do what you did? Why? He's not saying it to him وسلم, by means of interrogation. He's saying it to him, why would you do this? You're a believer. The Messenger والسلام, knows the hypocrites amongst the believers. And he knows that Hatib is not one of them. Why would you do this? So Hatib says, Ya Rasulullah, la ta'jal alayh, don't be hasty with me. He said, Wallahi, I believe in Allah and His Messenger. I am not a hypocrite. I am a believer. I truly do believe in Allah and His Messenger. He said, but I have no one to protect me and my family and my possessions if things go wrong in Mecca. All of these muhajireen have their tribesmen. They have someone to protect them. If things were to go wrong, they would at the end of the day be at the mercy of their tribes. Maybe they wouldn't be executed. Maybe things would be let go. Maybe things would be forgiven. But I, on the other hand, if we ended up in Mecca and this operation of returning to Mecca did not go well, then I would be in trouble. I would have no one to protect me. The Prophet ﷺ, imagine the incident. And everyone is like, yeah, whatever, right? The Prophet ﷺ said, Sadaqa, he told the truth, فَلَا تَقُولُ لَهُ إِلَّا خَيْرًا Don't even say anything to him except for good words. Now, this, blew, this shocked the companions because Hatib committed a grave offense here. This is treason. And the Prophet ﷺ says, listen, he told the truth, he's sincere, he made a mistake, don't use bad words with him. He's not going to be punished. And the Prophet ﷺ forgave him. Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu, Ali radiallahu anhu, Az-Zubayr radiallahu anhu, all of these companions start to say, Ya Rasulullah, the man just put us all in danger. And the Prophet ﷺ says to Umar radiallahu anhu, he said, isn't he one of those that fought alongside us in the battle of Badr? Wasn't he there with us in Badr? And the Prophet ﷺ says, You don't know, but maybe Allah looked at the people of Badr, the veterans of Badr, and said to them, Do whatever you want, I have forgiven you for everything. So this man belongs to the veterans of Badr. He is not some hypocrite that showed up and made excuses. He's a man that fought alongside us in Badr. And Allah may have looked at the people of Badr and said that you all are forgiven for everything. Because there is no way a hypocrite would be present in Badr. What was, what was supposed to be a massacre of the Muslims. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgave them all. So Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he started to cry and he said, Allahu ta'ala wa rasuluhu a'lam, Allah and his messenger know best. In this situation, the Prophet sallallahu forgave him. He let it go. He did not hold him accountable. Now here's the thing. There are other incidents where the Prophet ﷺ dealt with people differently. And I want us to actually contrast these two incidents. In another narration, there is a man who fought against the Prophet ﷺ in the Battle of Badr by the name of Abu Ghurra. And Abu Ghurra was a poet as well as a warrior. And we know that the Prophet ﷺ did not want to harm the captives of Badr. He let them go free. Some of them, he told them, if you teach 10 people how to read, you go free. Some of them, he said, just pay your way out. Some of them, their family members came and asked for them, and the Prophet ﷺ showed mercy. So the Prophet ﷺ dealt with supreme mercy with the, with the prisoners of Badr, even though they came with wine bottles to celebrate over the corpses of the believers. So here's the scenario. Abu Ghurra is in front of the Prophet ﷺ as a captive on the day of Badr, and he says, O Messenger of Allah, he said that I was forced to come out, let me go, I will never fight you again. The Prophet ﷺ said, Do you promise to never fight against us again? Abu Ghurra said, Yes. The Prophet ﷺ let him go. Abu Ghurra once again was present on the day of Uhud, fighting against the believers. So the Prophet ﷺ captured him. He was in front of the Prophet ﷺ. He said, Ya Rasulullah, I will never fight you again. He thought the Prophet ﷺ was going to do what he did in Badr. And the Prophet ﷺ said, 
لا يلدغ المؤمن من جحر واحد مرتين The believer is not stung in the same hole twice. The believer is not stung in the same hole twice. So he was executed. These two incidents are very interesting because you have one person who the Prophet slice him, and again, he's acting as a head of state. He has to act in the interests of the people, in the interest of his followers as well. One man, the Prophet ﷺ, lets go. The other one, the Prophet ﷺ, let him go as well. But the second time, the Prophet ﷺ rightfully punished him. He came to Medina to fight and to kill people. And very likely, if it was the Battle of Uhud, he did kill people. Right? Two times fighting against the Prophet ﷺ. The second time, the Prophet ﷺ sets a methodology for the believers and says, a believer does not allow himself to be stung in the same hole twice. Meaning being merciful is different from being naive. Do not expose yourself to be taken advantage of. That's not how a believer is supposed to function. And a lot of times when we just take one incident from the seerah of the Prophet and we say, MashaAllah, mercy. And yes, mercy, but his mercy did not limit him وسلم, to put everybody else at risk. Because if he would have said to him, you know what, go free, he would have been there in Khandaq too. Clearly, there is a pattern here. There, he's demonstrated a behavior that he's going to continue to hurt us. And the Prophet وسلم, dealt with him in regards to that. So how do we reconcile between these two incidents and what are some lessons we can take for ourselves from the seat of the Prophet Number one was Hatib, a threat to the community and would the Prophet have forgiven a second offense? Okay, meaning the Prophet here at this point Hatib is dealing with the Prophet in different circumstances. They are in a position where they are the overwhelming majority where literally the Prophet ﷺ could march into Mecca and not kill anybody, and still Mecca would come under his authority ﷺ, and he could forgive the people and all of that. So Hatib represents a different threat level. And would the Prophet ﷺ have forgiven him a second time? Allah knows best. Allahu A'lam. And we can only derive based on our assumptions that, you know, maybe if Hatib would have went and sold out or did something in Tabuk or did something in a future, you know, expedition and then it would have shown his insincerity in that situation. The second thing, obviously, we don't have access to the intuition or the revelation of the Prophet ﷺ. Clearly, we are not him, and he could see who is sincere and who is playing games and who is lying and so on and so forth, who is uh, playing a game of deception. So there are multiple issues here. The issue of power. The Muslims, in this case of Badr and Uhud, are, I mean... They, they're, they're being subject to a two attempted ge genocides at this point. So the passion that the Prophet ﷺ feels, the, the mercy that he has وسلم, may be that, you know what, I would like to be able to forgive this man and let him go and say he's not going to do anything anymore. But what about his mercy to the believers that he would be putting at risk in that situation? Shouldn't he have love for them too? Shouldn't he have mercy for them as well Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? So how do we bring this now to our level when I am in a situation where I have been hurt or, and I've been asked to forgive and I've been asked to let something go? There is a difference between forgiving and forgetting. There is a saying in the Bible, which is very profound actually, that, that, that Isa alayhi salam, that Jesus peace be upon him said, be shrewd as snakes but innocent as doves. A person has to be smart, but a person should not be evil as they have been taken advantage of by evil. So if I'm in a relationship and I've been abused, by extending a hand of forgiveness, that's one thing to say, you know what, I, I, I forgive you and I'll let things go and I won't hold you accountable. But it's another thing to say, you know what, here's a second chance, here's a third chance, here's a fourth chance, by which I put myself at risk and even worse than that, I have to ask myself, by forgiving, by forgetting about something, by extending a second chance, because forgiveness is a given. The believer should try to always clean their hearts. Because the more you occupy your heart with, with, with a grudge, the less you will be able to occupy it with the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to spiritually elevate yourself. That's a given. 
But by extending a second chance, number one, do I put myself at risk for a second time? The Prophet said the believer does not harm nor does he reciprocate harm. I should not be naive and put myself at risk a second time. The second thing, am I putting others at risk by extending a second chance? So you, want, you might want good for someone and you might want someone to seek forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you don't want them to be punished in hellfire, you don't want them to, be, to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's justice on the day of judgment, but at the same time, you also don't want to put people in harm's way. So for example, if there is someone that's a crook that's scamming people, right, and he scammed me on a business deal, and he, he went from being brother, mashallah, to being brother, astaghfirullah, very quickly. Started off nicely, I thought this was going to be great, and then you know what? I was taken advantage of. By me forgiving that brother, and then I see that brother going into business deals with other people, and not telling them, I'm also putting them in harm's way. And that's not the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. We had a messenger والسلام, that used to warn actively about people that could harm others. He showed us وسلم, in the example when a woman came to him والسلام, and asked you know, uh, about a particular uh, man. Actually, she asked about two men. And the Prophet وسلم, said, well, this guy always carries a stick on his shoulder and the other guy is stingy. He didn't want to put the woman in harm's way. It wasn't like, well, I really like that guy. I really love that brother. So I don't want to turn away this potential spouse from him. No, I love that brother, but that's my sister too. I care about her as well. I don't want her to be in harm's way. I don't want her to find herself in that situation. So I might forgive a person, but at the same time, I have a responsibility to others. I have a responsibility. In some situations, you know, an abusive household. I have a responsibility to my kids. If someone has exhibited a behavior of abuse and I let that go, I can forgive, but if I let that go and I don't make sure there are checks and accountability, I'm putting my kids in danger too. I'm putting people in danger as well. In the case of infidelity, I know that a lot of people don't want to hear this, but there's a difference between, between a person that committed an offense in a time of weakness and I forgive them and a person who has a pattern of behavior the Prophet ﷺ said the believer is not stung in the same hole twice. We also learn from him ﷺ, this is very powerful, actually in the Qur'an, very powerful the way the Sahaba applied this ayah. Allah mentions to us that there is a difference between a person who seeks forgiveness before they are caught and a person who gets caught and then asks for forgiveness. There's a difference. قَبْلَ أَن تَقْدِرُوا عَلَيْهِمْ Those who come forth before you have them in your grip. There's a difference. A person came to a recognition that they were causing harm, that, that I messed up, and then they come and they seek forgiveness. That's different from a person that is caught. Because in the first case, you can trust that that person, at least a little bit more, is seeking that forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and from the people that they may have harmed. So we have a methodology here that we take from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and you know what? We're human. And the Messenger والسلام, though he was the most perfect human being, he still showed us how to be human. Someone might come to me and say, you know, someone harmed me and I forgive them. But I don't want to be their friend anymore. Do I have to be their friend? Like, do we have to go back to the way it was? I forgive them. I don't hold any grudge against them. May Allah forgive them. لا تثريب عليكم اليوم. But you know what? I don't want to be Yusuf. I'm not Yusuf alayhi salam. Do I have to be Yusuf alayhi salam? Or can I say, you know what, you're forgiven, but at the same time, I don't want to hang out with you anymore. I don't want to be your friend anymore. I don't want to associate with you. Salamu alaikum, I'll see you, I'll smile at you. It's all good. I'm not going to hate you. I'm not going to make dua against you. I'm not going to pursue you. But I don't want to be your friend anymore. Even the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam gives us precedent for that. Yes. Rahmatan lil alameen. A mercy to the world. When Wahshi ibn Harb, who killed Hamza radiallahu ta'ala anhu, the uncle of the Prophet sallallahu who was the same age as the Prophet sallallahu who was the brother of the Prophet sallallahu he was breastfed from the same woman. He was so close to the Prophet sallallahu that some of the ulama came later on, they said, if there was one person that would have been able to rival Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu for the khilafah, it would have been Hamza.
We don't even know Hamza's history post Uhud because it didn't exist. But imagine if Hamza was there. Hamza, the first powerful man to accept Islam alongside the Prophet. So Wahshi, who struck the Prophet, who struck Hamza radiallahu anhu, caused the Prophet to cry like he never cried before, mutilated Hamza. Wahshi repented and became Muslim.